Uh, it's Wednesday night, and we're studying through the Bible. Uh, on Wednesday nights, we're studying Israel as a, as a history. There is a time period in Israel's history where they were a kingdom being ruled by kings. For several hundred years, they were ruled by judges, and these are the kings right here from Saul all the way down here to Zedekiah, the last king. And each one of those kings had prophets that would prophesy to them. They'd prophesy and tell them what they're supposed to do and when they were doing wrong. And they were actually the voice of the Lord. They were the mouth of God upon the earth. What we're trying to do, and that was during the time period of 1 Samuel all the way through 2 Chronicles. 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. This is the kings there in the 8th chapter of 1 Samuel. The people cry out, give us a man to be king over us. The ninth chapter, God consented to give them. He picked out Saul, and that would be their first king. God called him a captain is what he called him. And then all the way through the 36th chapter of 2 Chronicles, all these kings right here ruled during that time period. And the nation was split in two because of Solomon's apostasy allowing his 700 wives and 300 concubines to seek all these sun and tree goddesses. Now what we're doing, we're leading up to that by studying Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And this is called the law. <clears throat> and in Genesis, the land of Israel was given to Abraham in Genesis, the 17th chapter. It was promised in the 12th chapter Get thee up out of thy country and from thy kindred to a land that I'll show thee. And he promises the land of Israel, which is on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. It's right here, Mediterranean here. And they're a coastal nation. And then west of Israel, east of Israel is desert. It's a desert nation. It's called Jordan. It was called Ammon and Moab in the ancient world. Syria has always been Syria. That's a solution. That Syria was led by Seleucus, who was one of the generals of uh, Alexander the Great. When he died, there were four generals that took over his kingdom, and the one who received the lion's share was Seleucus, and his headquarters was in Damascus here in Syria. Damascus is said to be the oldest city in the world. It's been there longer than any other city. And then Lebanon is right here above Israel. Here's Israel. Lebanon is right here. That's the old ancient land of Tyre and Sidon. And, uh, or the ancient uh, world of Phoenicia, when you think of, when you hear Phoenicia in history. The desert of the Sinai Peninsula is down here. Egypt is over here. Here's Cairo. This is the, the rivers leading into the Nile River. And uh, then... You've got Iraq or Babylon over here, Iran or Persia, and this is Saudi Arabia. So Israel is surrounded by all these Arab nations. I was talking to my doctor, one of my doctors the other day. I have a new, a new uh, doctor that checks me for various things. She's Mary's doctor, and I can't even remember her name, Haji or something like that. She's an Afghanistanian, and I asked her, I said, are Afghanistanians... Middle East, East, I said, are they Arab? She said, no, absolutely not. I didn't know that. And uh, Afghanistan is just over here, uh, east of Iran. And Afghanistan, she said, was a part of the Far East. India, China, uh, what we call Vietnam, used to be the, uh, had many other names. And, uh, but she said that Afghanistan, Pakistan were not, Middle Eastern countries, and they're not Arabs. And, uh, but these are all Arab nations surrounding Israel. There's no wonder they worship Jehovah God. All of these Arab nations, including Turkey over here, they all worship Allah. Now, we're talking about Israel as a nation. We're headed towards there. God gives the land to Abraham, and then they're, they're sold into bondage when Joseph goes over into Egypt. There at the end in the beginning of Exodus, the first chapter, uh, when uh, Joseph is sold. And they stay there 400 years. Well, we're talking, where we are now, 
we're aiming towards Israel as a nation. The land was given to Abraham, and then they go into 400 years of bondage. This is not to be confused with the captivity. The captivity was over in Babylon. This is over in Egypt. Egypt is, Egypt is southwest. That's the, cap, that's the bondage. The captivity is, is north, then southeast, over here in Babylon. That's where they were carried to. So you got the captivity, you have the bondage. Don't confuse the two. I'll say captivity sometime for bondage. Y'all can say, y'all can say bondage. I'll say okay. But I'll do that. I'll do the same thing. What we're aiming for is Israel as a nation. That is before they become a nation. And after they're a nation, and after God blinds their eyes and pours out of his spirit on all flesh, the Gentiles in the church, the predestinated elect of God, uh, for the last 2,000 years, we look back to Israel as a nation, and everything that they did, we have become spiritual Israel. A Jew is not outwardly above the heart. Circumcision is the heart. So everything, the focal point of all history of the Bible is this right here, right there. It is Israel as a nation. If you do not understand 1 Samuel through 2 Chronicles and what led them into a nation by the promise of God to Abraham, you're not going to understand any part of the Bible. This is why preachers don't understand the Bible. Most Protestant churches say, we're a New Testament church, and that's all you can get out of them. And the only thing they know about the Old Testament is there was a man named David, and, and he slew the Goliath, and, and Noah built an ark, and they took in the animals two by two. Well, and sevens by sevens. And, and they know about Daniel's in the lion's den. Ain't that cute? And that's about all they know. They don't know that all those characters was a part of this lineage right here. So we're looking back to Israel as a nation, and we've become spiritual Israel, and they were looking forward to it because God said, I'll be your God, and you'll be my people, and you'll obey me, and if you don't do that, I'll send sword, famine, pestilence, Finally, I'll send the beast, which is Babylon, to carry you away into captivity, and they'll be overthrown by Persia, and then Greece, and then Rome. And they will rule until the end of time when I call my people out of all the nations of the world. And God's people are believing Israel, not just anybody in Israel, because they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Now, where we are, we've got Moses out of, We've got Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. The word Exodus, we got a word exit from Exodus. When you have an Exodus, you have a movement out. And they're moving out of Egypt. And where we are, we've just crossed the Red Sea last week. And, you know, it's utterly astounding. They're headed into the desert. Some say they're about two and a half million people in every I keep saying it depends on the historian that you read don't come up and say I read this horse story and he said this well it may be true and it may not be true unless they have documentation I hear all kinds of gossip all the time about people on the internet and what happened and you have to double check and then you have to use if we're talking about the Bible you have to use this as criteria not what uh, historians say if they contradict the word of God. Now, we're, we're leaving Egypt, leaving Egypt with approximately two and a half million people. Now, you're going to see when we get to numbers. Numbers means a counting. And that's not the only place they'll count Israel, but a counting. It's a counting of the people who left Israel. But all they uh, who left Egypt, but the only people they count are men. Now Jesus did something about that when he got uh, into the New Testament. He said, "I'm tired of women being oppressed." So he's we're not going to go into that, but we'll go into that another time. Now all they counted was men, and by the count of men, they know they didn't try to practice any kind of birth control. The women wanted all the babies they could get because Genesis three fifteen says. 
that I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the first prophecy of Messiah. And every woman that was an Israelite, even some that were just associated with Israel, like uh, Lot's uh, daughters, they thought, well, maybe there's a chance that we will be uh, the ancestor mother of the Messiah, so we'll take our father up into the mountain. When they came out of Sodom, which is just south of the Dead Sea, if this is Israel here, and, and the Dead Sea is here, and you got, you got down here is Sodom. And when they came out of Sodom, uh, they went over here into what we call Jordan. Jordan. And later on, it became the land of Moab and Ammon or Ammon. And where Ammon and, jo and Moab comes from, when Lot and his two daughters came over, they... His daughter said they got their father drunk one night and they said, maybe we are the mother of the Messiah, one of us, even though our father is Abraham's nephew. So they took their father up into a cave, both of them, and molested their father so that the seed of their father wouldn't die. And they both had sons, and one of the sons' name, the eldest name was Moab, and the youngest was ben -Ami. And Ben-Ami was named, they get to uh, Ammon, the land of Ammon or Ammon, Jordan. That's the capital of Jordan. Ammon, Jordan. That's Jordan's capital up here in the north. So, I don't know where I was going with this. <laughs> get to going too much. But where we are, we're bringing Abraham out of the, out of the land giving it to Abraham. They go into bondage for 400 years, and after, they get into, after they're coming out, where we've come to, this is where we've studied up to. We've studied up to, and we don't know the boundaries and how they look. That's similar to the way it looks today, but the boundaries have changed over the millennia. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Up here is Turkey. Turkey. Or they called Asia Minor. And uh, then you got Greece over here and so forth. And you got uh, Lebanon or Tyre and Sidon there. Well, where we are, they've come out of, they've come out of, there's the Nile, come out of Egypt. They've gone over here and crossed the Red Sea. And God has destroyed Pharaoh's armies in that 14th chapter of Exodus. Now, what we're going to do is adventure from Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you say, Jim, why do we study all this? Because God gave it to us. And I believe if you begin to understand the Old Testament, you'll start seeing a picture of the new. Now, they've come out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea. God drowned all of the Egyptian army under Pharaoh was considered the most powerful force upon the earth at that time. There was no one that was powerful as Pharaoh's armies. At different times, they would be, as I say, they would be like a bubbling cauldron of power in this portion of the world, and it would be a small cauldron, and then be a great big bubble of power over here, then be this huge cauldron over here that would be ruling the world. And as these others would come up and build their forces, whether it's Assyria, Babylon, whoever gets the strongest goes in and attacks the others. It's not any different than Adolf Hitler not any different than Attila the Hun, not any different than Napoleon, not any different. Do you think that Adolf Hitler was the only guy that went out there and slaughtered people, butchered them? Not any different than America, the way we destroyed most of the Indian tribes of America. Most of them are not in existence today because we slaughtered them. The same way America destroyed the black man, the same way we destroyed the Mexicans and stole their land, stole Texas, New Mexico, and California through a Tennessee president, James Knox Polk, where he started a war in Mexico, which was called Texas back then. I, that's another story. Now, they're over here. They're crossing the Red Sea, and that's where we are 
in the 16th chapter of Exodus. Now, what you're going to see, you're going to see Israel, it's not going to tell you everywhere they stopped. Well, there's one place it'll tell you most everywhere they stopped, but it won't tell you everything happened everywhere they stopped because they had all this kind of stuff going on like this. We don't know exactly where Mount Sinai was, somewhere in Arabia, but two and a half million people cannot move that fast. Let me, this had to be a terrifying thing. I got to thinking today about trust. Trust God. Believe God. You know, I've had, has anybody had a trouble figuring out what trust is? And what believing is. How do you trust God? Well, how do you trust anybody? You listen to them. If they make sense. And you place your trust in them. You start doing what they say, don't you? You do. You act according to them. You cannot trust yourself to get yourself to heaven. So what you have to do is place your trust in someone else. Except you can't do it. Because there's none that seeketh after God. So God has to put trust. One of the words for trust in the Greek text is the word pistuo, which is the word believe. I said this before. Trust is doing on some, someone else's information. If you are going to go up to Colorado and you're going to cross that Royal Gorge Bridge, it's a thousand drop down. I couldn't stand going across it because... I have this tremendous fear of heights. It's not something I can help, and it's not that I'm chicken. If I, when something comes on TV and they're way up high and the guy's walking around the edge of a building, I start getting pains from about here all the way down. That's a horror story to me. I have to turn it off. I'm going, oh, oh, get off of there. You know, it drives me crazy. I can't stand it. So if I was going to drive across that bridge, I'd have to do what I tell you not to do. I'd have to hire a structural engineer and have him go out and measure the bridge and get the tensile strength of all those cables that hold that up and find out just how much tonnage that would hold. And then after it's all over with, I'd say, I've got to get a geologist to find out if those rocks will hold that on both sides. And then after I, all the testing could be done, I'd say, I still don't trust it uh, because I can't handle that. Mary and I went up to Grand Canyon and they have this little circular shaped thing that goes out across there and it's a straight drop and you see down through it not me I'm not going to look down it she would get right over there at the edge of Grand Canyon I'd stand about 20 30 feet away I said get away from there Mary it's like it bothers me for somebody to get close it's like I think they're going to stumble over a rock and there they go you know and uh, so but trust is looking at Jesus if you if you hire a, somebody to work for you, you trust that they know what they're doing and they know how to build that room for you or build that garage or you trust that the electrician can, you turn it over to them. Trusting is not knowing absolutely. That's not what it is. I just don't know I'm saved. Well, nobody knows they're saved. And everybody goes to Second Timothy and says, well, Paul said, I know whom I believe. He didn't say I'm absolutely positively sure. That's not what he said. He said, I'm an apostle, I'm a preacher, and I'm a teacher. And he says, I suffer for these things, for telling people the truth about predestination, about Christmas is pagan, God doesn't love everybody, and people persecute me for it. Therefore, I, I know whom I have believed, I ido, I see. What he's saying, because I'm suffering for doing these things, that I would not have done when I was young. When I was young, he said, I'm seeing Christ come alive in me and change me into somebody that I wouldn't recognize. I'm trusting God. I'm putting my trust in Him, but we can't even trust Him unless He puts the trust in our hearts to trust Him. We can't save ourselves. So don't go around saying, Mary will tell me often, I don't know that I'm saved. Does anybody any else feel that way? Well, good. If you say, I know absolutely that I'm saved, that don't mean a thing. People that say that are some Baptists and some free will church. 
I, rem I know I'm saved because I walked down the aisle and I accepted Christ. Well, you can't accept Christ. What does that do to your knowing? I prayed a prayer. I walked down there and the preacher said that God had to save me if I walked down there and accepted Christ and prayed that prayer. I know that I did what the preacher said, therefore God is obligated to save me. I'm sorry, but that ain't it. Paul said, I see who I believe in. So if you trust God, you act on what he says, and Lord, you say, Lord, I'm depending on you to destroy Pharaoh's armies and all the things that are besetting me and anything that would destroy me. I'm trusting you, but if you trust God, you can't trust God while you're living for self. If you're living for self, it's not God you trust. If you trust God, remember, believe and faith are the same word because faith, pistis, pistis is the noun form of the verb believe. And whatever faith is, believing or trusting is, and faith comes by hearing, and hear and obey are the same word. So if you believe God, you're obeying what He says. You're going to start cleaning your life up. You're going to clean your mouth up. You're going to clean your old ways up. Uh, you're going to say, I can't do all the things I used to do. I can't chase women. I can't chase men. I can't go boogieing. I can't go bar hopping at night. I can't smoke pot. I can't, I can't cuss. I can't drink. I can't. God help me to stop this. That's trusting God. It's not being saved by works, but it's putting, it's, our faith is in the things He says. And you're going to wrestle with what He said do. And then you're going to watch yourself suffer. And then you can say, I see who am I believe in. When people say, I know I'm saved, they always mean gnosko or gnosis. Gnosis is a form of gnosko. It means knowledge. Knowledge that you have learned. Well, this is like being learning something from somebody. Somebody. Somebody telling you something. But ito is like first-hand witness. I'm watching Jim Brown change and suffer for things he wouldn't even thought of suffering for when he was young. I'm going to stand for truth. So that's trusting God. When Moses leaves Egypt, he has never been into a desert before. He's going to take two and a half men going to a desert. He must be trusting somebody. He certainly cannot trust himself to feed and clothe and give all those people all that food and water they need. That doesn't make any sense. Yes, but the faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope, el pizzo, means to anticipate a promise that's been made or anticipate and expect something that has been told you. You expect the guy... You expect the guy to repair your house in two days if that's what he said. If he takes your money and you don't see him for a month, you say something's wrong. Can't trust him anymore. We use that word trust easy. You should think about the things you trust in life. We're going to put our ultimate trust and believe that Jesus is going to save us and we believe he's going to deliver us in this life just like Moses believed him. Just like David would say these things over and over. Moses was going into a place he'd never known of. Look over here in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Look here. Now here is trust. Hebrews 11. You want to know what trusting God is? This will kind of tell you. Notice these people had never done these things before. Look here, we're not going to read all of them. But look down here in verse 7. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Noah had never seen any rain. It had never rained for 16, over 1,600 years. Water had never fallen from the sky. Never. You might as well have told Noah, there's some literal cats and literal dogs are going to fall out of the sky. Now, build an ark. Build an ark? 
Yeah, 300 cubits long, 450 feet long, 30 cubits high, 45 feet high, and 50 cubits wide. That's 75 feet wide. And I want you to build it right out here in your backyard where there is no water. Why would he have to go down to where there's some water to build it? Because the water's going to be in his yard, isn't it? That's probably why one of the reasons they were laughing at him. What are you going to do with a boat that size? There's no water near here. Well, by faith, no being warned of God of things not seen as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. He had never seen rain. Well, where'd the water come from? In the second chapter of Genesis, water went up from the ground as a mist from the ground to water the earth. To say it's going to rain is like, that's ridiculous. What's rain? If it's never rained before, what do you call it? Huh? Hey, look down here. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance obeyed, and he went out not knowing where he was going. He's relying on the promises of God. If you read this book, I'll be with you always, even at the end of the world. I'll conquer your enemies. I'll deliver you. When you're my people, all you have to be is obedient to me. Well, it hadn't worked for me yet. Well, you're not old enough yet. If you're old enough, it would have worked already. You say, I'm 70 years old. I'm 65 years old. I'm... Well, you're still not old enough if you haven't been believing God that long. You're old enough when God beats you up long enough to get your attention. That's when you're old enough. Or when he beats you up real, real bad. Now, I had a fellow call me, the fellow, I, the fellow uh, that I talked to. I read a letter about Richard. Richard called me one time back in 1998. He's gone through all this sin and years of been to prison and been in all kinds of sin and trouble. Back then, he was real committed to the Lord and well, not as committed as he thought. I'll use him as an illustration. And uh, he called me one time and said, I'd really like to have a lot of patience right now. I said, well, let's pray that God will break your neck and make you quadriplegic, okay? Dear Lord, oh, wait a minute, I don't want that. Well, God took has taken him down a long, hard road. Now, it appears he may be ready to really serve the Lord. So God has to take everybody through a lot of fire down the road to make us trust him. Trust is a very unusual thing. You trust something and you keep trusting it and you keep doing what it says do. You keep on believing God. You keep on doing his truth. You start giving up self. You say, that was fun. You're going to get old enough where it's not going to be fun anymore. And you're going to have to stop doing it, and it should, we should stop before we get old. You won't stop doing everything, but you'll stop doing some of it, and it'll go away a little at a time, and if you get old enough, there won't be a whole lot of it left, but there'll be some left. That's not giving you a license and permission to go out and bar hop and sleep around and drink and cuss and smoke. That's not giving you a license. I'm just telling you, the longer you live, the more fire you go through, the more God's going to burn out self and you're going to start living godly. You can't, you don't live godly so God will make you important. You live godly for the sake of living godly. That's it. Or cause so God will reward you. And let me tell you, if you live godly, he'll make you content with such things as you have. Now, and every time somebody, let's look at a little bit more of that. Abraham did not know where he was going. Noah didn't know what he was doing. Noah has never seen a flood. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise. God promised him the land. We can go on down here. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac... He offered Isaac in that 22nd chapter of Genesis. And what, now here's faith. Here's trust. This is trust. God tells Abraham in the 15th chapter of Genesis, you're going to have a son. And I'm going to bless all the earth with that son. And he gives him the land in 
the 17th chapter of Genesis. And he makes a covenant with him. And he says, I'm going to make a covenant with you and I'm going to give this covenant to your son Isaac. Okay. Isaac is born in the 21st chapter. In the 22nd chapter, God says to Abraham, I want you to go up there on Mount Moriah and I want you to kill Isaac. Ooh, I thought you said, he didn't say, I thought you said you're going to bless all the earth and Isaac. He didn't say that. You know what he said when he said, I want you to go up there and kill Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice? Abraham said, okay. See, Abraham really believed God. Now, that's trust. Yeah. He didn't believe God would ever go back on his promise. He knew he wouldn't. And this 11th chapter of Genesis tells you about that. Read it with me. He said, I want you to kill Isaac. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now, Isaac was like about 13 years old when he was going to offer him up. Well, God puts a ram in the bushes and says, and he stops his hand from killing Isaac. An angel comes, stops and says, I've got a substitute over here. Offer that one, that substitute. And Christ was our substitute. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Because Isaac was raised from the dead loins of his father who was 100 years old and the dead loins of his mother who was 90 years old. And that's the resurrection. And that's the gospel that was preached to Abraham. And here's what Abraham did. Abraham accounted, accounted, that's the word logizomai, he reckoned or reasoned. Abraham accounted that God was able to raise him up if he killed him, he's going to raise him from the dead. Even from the dead, from whence he had always already received him in a figure. The word figure is parabole. It's our word parable. You see, Abraham, believe, Abraham, when you read the Bible, go against your own desires, your lustful reasoning, your desires for self, and believe God and do what he says and be not weary in well-doing. You'll reap a reward, Moses, in due time if you don't faint at Pharaoh's armies. I'll take you through the Red Sea and then I'll take you through the wilderness. And everywhere you go, I'll conquer your enemies. All you have to do is believe me and do what I say. And life turns out like a bowl of cherries. It don't turn out the way you want it to turn out financially. It don't turn out the way you want it, uh, the woman you want, the man you want, the car you want, the house you want. But whatever you wanted, God makes you content with what he gives you and he makes you happier with what he does in your life than you can do with your own life. God has made me more happy and content at my age than I ever thought I could be being a big star that I was seeking to be, being a big rich man that I was seeking to be. He's, I have never, I can't imagine being this content. I don't look up to people that's got lots of money or people that are bankers or lawyers or moguls or stars or company heads. I know that they're just like me. There's no temptation make, taking me, but such as is common to them. Therefore, I know if I have admitted the sin in my heart, I know what they're like. I don't care who they are, whether it's Billy Graham or who it is. Me and I was down at, down at Lowe's last night with Victor. And so I got a girl down there and had her breast popping out of her dress. And Victor said, Jim, I'm sorry I looked at that. I said, I can't help but see it either. I said, the point is, I liked it and you liked it. I said, every man alive likes it. And I said, so does Billy Graham and so does Charles Stanley. Only thing is, they're going to pretend they don't and they lie. I said, what you have to do is say, God help me. I like that. I had a preacher one time say, when I walk through a checkout line, some girl doesn't have much clothes on, I say, that offends me. I said, well, that's not what I say. I say, ma'am, can I turn that around? I like that too much. And any man that don't say that is lying through his teeth or he's a homosexual. <laughs> One of the two. You see, that problem stays with you when you're old. 
doesn't it, man? Yes, sir. So what we have to do is fight that. What I want to do is go up to some girl and say, ma'am, here's a coat. Put on this coat. What you're doing is causing every man in the store to lust after you. And that really makes me mad. Not so much mad at you, but whoever has taught you to do this. Because we like it. That's why you need to cover up. Not because we don't like it. It's not like, Jim, you don't like that this is sin. Oh, I do like that. That's why I have to stay away from it. Let me tell you men something. I said it to Victor. That's not yours and you can't have it. All it does is tantalize you. Stay away from it. Isn't that right? It's not yours. You're not going anywhere with it, so get over it. Now, that's putting it simple. That's not any different than going out and let your tongue hang out at the Mercedes place every Sunday, and i got to have one of those. I'm just trying to climb the ladder. i just got to have one of those. I'll work four jobs to get it. Not any different. That's idolatry, isn't it? Serving what you see. We need to learn these things. Now, where we are, Moses is leaving, going into a desert, with two and a half million people. Let me read it to you one more time. This is something that was sent to me. And this is a mathematical miracle. And I'm going to read this again. This is what Moses was contending with. And evidently some scientific mind has correlated all this together. Moses and the people of Israel were in the desert. But what was he going to do with them? This shows you trust in God. They had to be fed, and feeding two or three million people requires a lot of food every day. Two to three million was somewhere about double the size of Nashville and all of the cities around it. That many people walking into a desert. Everybody in Nashville, everybody in Lebanon, Murfreesboro, Gallatin, Hendersonville, Fairview, uh, Franklin, name them. They had to be fed, and feeding two to three million people requires a lot of food. According to the quartermaster general in the army, it is reported that Moses would have, have to have 1,500 tons of food every day. Do you know that, this, that to bring that much food each day, two freight trains, each a mile long, would be required every day? That's how much manna God had to put on the ground. I mean, that had to be thousands of acres of manna. Thousands of acres. Besides, you must remember, they were out in the desert. They would have to have firewood to use in cooking the food. This would take 4,000 tons of wood and a few more freight trains, each a mile long just for one day. And just think, they were 40 years in transit. Oh yes, they would have to have water. If they only had enough to drink and wash a few dishes, it would take 11 million gallons each day and a freight train with tank cars 1,800 miles long just to bring water. Let me tell you, when Moses spoke to the rock, when well, he was supposed to speak to the rock, when he struck it the first time, it couldn't have been a rock this big. It had to be a rock the size, uh, had to be a mountain rock where the river would flow out. And then another thing. They had to get across the Red Sea in one night. If they went on a narrow path, double file, the line would be 800 miles long and would require 35 days and nights to get through. That's why God probably rolled the water. There's scientific minds that have correlated this. Roll the water out long distance. They're not going to walk through walls of water and they see the miracle of God have raised this water up and they're going to walk through right after the children of Israel walk between this water. They probably saw it coming like a tidal wave. It's back several miles this way and several miles this way and they're walking like one big line through there. Let me read that again. It has to be 800 miles long, require 35 days and nights to get through, so there had to be a space in the Red Sea three miles wide 
so they could walk 5,000 abreast to get over in one night. But then another problem. Each time they camped at the end of a day, a campground two-thirds the size of the state of Rhode Island was required, or a total of 750 square miles. Think of it, this much space just for nightly camping. Do you think Moses figured all this out before he left Egypt? We're talking about trusting God. If God does say something to you like, kill Isaac, and you say, I will do that because you know that God will raise him. God says, Moses, go into the desert, and it's impossible for you to get through it with this many people. No possible way, but I'll get you through. When you think you have a hard time, God cannot figure out what he's doing with you. Do you think Moses figured all this out before he left Egypt? I think not. You see, Moses believed God. God took care of these things for him. Now, do we not think that God, that God has any problem taking care of our needs? Don't think so. Now, that's an amazing feat, isn't it? And every time you turn around, God is doing right. You say, I never saw any miracles in my life. I look at my life over the past 30, 35 years, and it is a miracle where I've come from too. But at any given time, it didn't look like a miracle was going on in my life. God was changing my mind very, very slowly from being a heathen to wanting to live for the Lord every day. And that he changes us in time, but he requires obedience. It's not trust. If you trust Christ, you believe. You don't care about Bible. I believe God. I believe it my way and you believe it your way. If you even believe that, you don't believe God. There's only one way to believe it. And that's the truth of it. You can't sit around making excuses for God, can you? Now, let's go back over here to the 16th chapter. They've crossed the Red Sea, and let's finish up the 15th chapter. We've 15th chapter, they crossed the Red Sea in the, in the 14th chapter. 15th chapter is the song of Moses. They're praising God for destroying Pharaoh, and they come to their first encampment. Now, verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. We don't know where that is. They, it's, then he says, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness. However far that two to three million people can travel in three days with a bunch of women old women and a bunch of little babies and they're walking along and some are riding on, on uh, donkeys and some on camels and they're going pretty slow. That many people don't move real fast. When, and he says they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah and Marah means bitter. Now, Marah, we get the name of my wife, Mary, or Miriam, from the word Marah. It means bitter. That's what, remember Naomi, when her, when her uh, dog, she came back from the land of Moab. She was an Israelite. She came from Moab and brought Ruth with her. Ruab, Ruth was her daughter-in-law, and her son, Kilian, and Malin had died, and Orpah stayed over here in Moab. When she came back, she said, you can call me instead of Naomi, you can call me Marah, which means bitter. That's in the book of Ruth. That's that first chapter. Now they say that this Marah was Arun Musa, A-R-Y-U-N. They believe it was possibly A-R-Y-U-N, M-U-S-A, Musa. They believe this that it was a, they called it the spring of Moses. It's taken on, it's the only green spot near the Red Sea. It's called, it's about one and a half miles from the Red Sea, and it's called the city of seven, or it's called the oasis of seven wells. So they're only about a mile and a half into the desert. They went to a lot of places. I should show you something before we get further into this, just to show you where they went, everything in the, Bible, in the Bible is not in sequential order. It doesn't naturally follow on the heels of everything else. Like the book of Revelation is not sequential. It's different visions of John. 
And most of it is from different points of view. Like you got the end of time in Revelation 6, Revelation 8, uh, Revelation 10, Revelation 11, Revelation 14, Revelation 15, Revelation 16, Revelation 18, and Revelation 19. You got the end of time. That's not sequential. It's just looking at it from different viewpoints. Let me show you something here. Go to Numbers, the 33rd chapter. Now, Numbers is not the end of the law. When you're reading, Israel does just like we'll do. They stop in the middle of a conversation in the middle of the book, and they'll say, okay, here's all the things that happened. In the 33rd chapter of Numbers, this is going to tell you everywhere that Israel... I won't read all of them. I'll read some of them. This is everywhere they went. These are the journeys of the children of Israel which went forth out of the land of Egypt with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now, with their armies, with their people, they weren't an army. They had never had, had training. They'd been in bondage for 400 years, haven't they? You have to stop. Uh, I didn't look up the word army, but usually it doesn't just mean military men. It's with all the force that they had. Remember, when they get to the promised land in Judges, the third chapter, because they don't drive out all the pagans out of the promised land, God says, I'm going to turn you over these five lords of the Philistines and all these others to teach you to war. So this is not an army as such. Let's read on here. This just shows you where they're going. And it goes all the way through where they proceed to go when they leave Egypt in that in that 16th chapter, all the way to the end of Deuteronomy, Moses wrote their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord, and these are their journeys according to their goings out. Now, when you think of this, you think, we're coming out of Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world. This is like the world over here. When we're born again, we're going into the desert of persecution and tribulation and affliction. All of that is a picture of this wilderness here. That's us in the wilderness. Then when we come up north of the Dead Sea and they enter into Canaan, that's a picture of heaven. They're Old Testament Israel, we're New Testament Israel. This is the, this is the time of... And what did they do all the time without that? They murmured against God. And what do most believers do in this world? going through tribulation fire. They murmur and gripe and complain. Have you ever been guilty of that? Don't lie. Everybody has, haven't we? Huh? My problems and my, my wife left me, my husband left me. And you know the fights we had and he wanted this and he wanted the car. I wanted the house and she did this and they did that. My neighbor stole from me and my cousin did this and, and my boss is and I'm griping and I'm murmuring and complaining. Not any different than them. I have done that. I've done as much as anybody. Everybody here is guilty, aren't we? Everybody. But we are at least we're we're in the wilderness. The world hasn't been called out of Egypt. That's the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, have they? They're not called out. Let's read some here. Moses wrote their goings out according to the journey by the commandment of the Lord, and these are the journeys according to their goings out. Here's where they went. They departed from Ramses, which was a city there in Egypt. This is when they left. In the first month, that was in the month Nisan, that was the month when Passover was. Nisan or Abib, and Nisan, they didn't call it Nisan until they ended up in Egypt. Called a beeb. That's the first months of their year, March, April. That's when they left, wasn't it? Passover time. That's what it's saying right here. Let me put it this way. They departed from Ramses at Passover time, the first month. On the 15th day of the first month, that's the day after the 14th day. The 14th day is Passover, isn't it? The next morning, they're leaving Egypt. He's telling the story right here. Oh, you can get the story out of Acts, the seventh chapter, when Stephen was standing before the Sanhedrin. You can get it throughout. You can get it in the 89th Psalm. You can get it all through the Old Testament and the New. On the morrow after the Passover, there you are. The children of Israel went out 
with a high hand, with a powerful hand, in the sight of all the Egyptians. For the Egyptians buried all their firstborn because they'd been killed, right? Which the Lord had smitten among them upon their gods. Remember he said in that 12th chapter, it was an attack on their gods. Also the Lord executed judgment, and the children of Israel removed from Ramses and pitched in Succoth. And they departed from Succoth and pitched in Etham, which is at the edge of the wilderness. And they removed from Etham, and that's where we are right now in that 16th chapter. The 16th chapter, they took their journey from Elam. He calls it Etham here. They had different spellings for different names. And turned again unto Pahiroth, which is before Beelzephon, and they pitched before Migdal, and they departed from Pithiroth and passed through the midst of the sea into the wilderness and went three days in the wilderness of Etham and pitched in Malah. That's the last part of that 15th chapter. Remember, I just read it. Just read it. They came to Marah, verse 23. And they removed from Marah. No, here's where they come to Elam. I said Etham up there earlier. Here's where they come to Elam in the 16th chapter and came to Elam. And Elam were 12 fountains of water and three score and ten palm trees and they pitched there about a mile and a half from the Red Sea. So they're moving slow. They're going a lot of places, aren't they? And they're removed from Elam and encamped by the Red Sea so they go back over by the Red Sea. God has them wandering. What's he got them wandering for? He's going to kill off everyone 40 years old and upward. He has them move away from the Red Sea, go back over to the Red Sea, move over here, over here, over here. And encamped in the wilderness of sin. And they took their journey out of the wilderness of sin and encamped in Dafka and they, dark, and they departed from Dafka and encamped in Alush. And they removed from Alush and encamped at Rephidim where there was no water for the people to drink. And then another episode, murmuring against God and then Moses has to get some water out of the rock. They departed from Rephidim and pitched in the wilderness of Sinai to get the book of the law. Well, when they get to Sinai, this is the wilderness. They removed from the desert of Sinai and pitched at Kibath Hatava, and they departed from Kibroth Hatava and encamped at Hazaroth, and they departed from Hazaroth and pitched in Rithma, and they departed from Rithma and pitched at Rimon Paraz. And they departed from Rimon Paraz and pitched in Libna, and they removed from Libna and pitched at Risa, and they journeyed from Risa and pitched in Kehil Athan, and they went from Kehil Athan and pitched in Mount Shafar. And they go all the way through here, and you get up to verse 38. And Aaron the priest went up to Mount Hor at the commandment of the Lord. Now, Hor is a word for mountain. Har Megiddo means the mountains of Megiddo. That's where we get Armageddon, Har Megiddo. And died there in the 40th year. Now, we're not up to the death of Moses yet. And after the children of Israel were out of the land of Egypt in the first day of the fifth month, Aaron was 120 and three years old when he died in Mount Hor. But wait a minute, Moses doesn't die till the 33rd chapter of Deuteronomy. All the writer is giving us, Moses wrote the book of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But he certainly didn't write that verse there, did he? Moses died. And he didn't write the last chapter of Deuteronomy. People say, what in the world happened? Usually most of the scholars will tell you that the part they didn't write was probably an assistant by their closest uh, person to them, which would have been Joshua. He probably wrote that part of Numbers and wrote this here. And all it doesn't mean all of the law was written at the same time or an exact sequence. In fact, if you look over there at the 33rd chapter, 34th chapter, excuse me, of Deuteronomy, Moses was 100, and in verse 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died. You got him dying here. But the proper placement would be at the end of Deuteronomy because he dies right before they cross the Jordan River and go in and possess the land in the next 
in Joshua, the first chapter, God's given Joshua the orders to go in and possess the land to make the divisions of the land up. Let's go back over here. I just wanted you to see. You can go through there and study that 33rd chapter of Numbers and he says down in verse 52, Then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures, destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck down all their high places, and ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land. God tells them that in the book of Numbers, and they don't do that in the book of Judges, the first chapter. They marry them. Goodness. And dwell then, for I have given you the land to possess it. So pay attention to the fact I showed you last week that the death of Belshazzar happens before in Numbers, the, in Daniel, the fifth chapter, happens before the fifth year of his reign in Daniel, the seventh chapter. Everything is not def particularly sequential, happening in sequence as, it, as the happenings come along. You have to study the Bible that way. Some chapters belong over here, some over here. Now, God has his reasons for that. Probably because there in Daniel 7, he's going to explain all the base system. It's like telling part of a story to somebody and then going back and reiterating or telling part of the story again and backing up from where you were over here. You understand what I'm saying? You tell a story down to here, then you come back to tell it again, and you back up to this part of the story and start from here and tell up to here. That's kind of the way I teach, isn't it? I'll teach one week. I'll reset things and add all this new stuff here. I had a teacher come here one time. She said, you teach the way they teach us to teach in teaching school. But I do it because I know that I'll lose everybody if I jump right in where I left off. I'll lose a lot of people here, and I'll certainly lose a lot of people out there. Now let's go back here. And let's resume where we were here in this 23rd chapter of, uh, in the 15th chapter, let's read on down through the end of this chapter. When they were come to Moron, verse 23, this is in chapter 16 of Exodus. For they were bitter, therefore the name of it is called bitter. And people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord. The Lord showed him a tree which he, when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made them a statute and an ordinance. There he proved them. Now, a statute and an ordinance is a word of God. That's God's laws, right? When I think of bitter and sweet, I immediately think of Revelation, the 10th chapter. Let's go over there. Do I believe God changes from one place in the Bible, in front of the Bible, to the end of the Bible? No, I don't believe that. Revelation 10. All right. Revelation 10. How much time do I have, Mike? All right. Revelation 10. Now, this is where Christ is standing. Uh, he's got a rainbow over his head. I'm not going to go into why I believe it's Christ. There's too much there. Rainbow is the word iris. And he has a rainbow over his head. He comes back and puts one foot on the land, the other on the sea. It says time is no more. This is the same Jesus that's coming back with eyes as a flame of fire in Revelation, the ninth chapter, in Flaming Fire, in Second Thessalonians, is the first chapter. And he's coming back... Uh, it, as the lightning shines from the east to the west, there in Revelation 24, uh, 27, 28, and he's coming back in First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. He's coming back, bringing all of his saints with him, and he puts one foot on the land, the other on the sea, swears by him that lives forever and ever, in verse 6, time should be no more. Then let's read... In verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God, which is the church, should be finished. Teleos means complete. He hath declared to his servants the prophets, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go, take the little book which is, which is open 
in the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. We know where that little book is over here in the fourth chapter, excuse me, in the fifth chapter of Revelation, verse 1. And I saw in the, hand, in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. With him that sits on the throne. The one that sits on the throne in the previous chapter is Jesus. He's the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's also the king. I'm not going to go into all that right now. So we seem, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? We find in the first chapter, now this is the book in his right hand. The right hand is the hand of authority. He has in his, this is Jesus who stands amidst the seven candlesticks in the first chapter. He's got seven stars in his right hand. Look. Seven stars in the first chapter. Let me write this down. Seven stars in right hand. That's Revelation. The first chapter, look at that. Revelation, and this has to do with the sweet and the bitter. God paints these pictures for us all through Scripture. Now look here. In chapter 1, verse 16, He had in His right hand seven stars, and out of His mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. So that's one sixteen. 116. And what are the seven stars? In verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in the right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, and Jesus is standing in the midst of them, in verses 11 and 12 and 13. The mystery of the seven stars and the seven candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels. The seven angels. Seven angels. Angelos, messengers, that's just the common Greek word for messenger, angel, just means messenger, it doesn't mean necessarily a heavenly creature, it can be, but it can be me or you when we have the message of God. And the, these are the seven angels of the seven churches. Seven is the number of refinement. This is the church refined, that's what it is. And what does the church do? We preach, don't we? We're messengers. We preach God's statutes and commandments. Now, that's in the right hand of Christ. Right hand is hand of authority. Jesus is said to be sitting at the right hand of the Father on some throne here. Jesus is said to be sitting here. But that's just a figurative term for the person in authority. Well, the little book in his right hand, the little book in Revelation, the fourth chapter, the little book is in his right hand. Little book, Revelation 4 and 1. Little book is in his right hand. The book of God is his, where his law is written, kept inside the Ark of the Covenant from that previous chapter. Law are God's statutes and his commandments. Law. Now, for thou hast created all things, oh, excuse me, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written, and on the backside sealed with seven seals, and saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book? No man in heaven or on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look upon, and I wept much, because no man found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith, Unto me weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is Jesus, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book. So Jesus opens the book. So when you go back to Revelation, the 10th chapter, we see the little book, verse 8, the voice I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel. 
Jesus is called an angel or messenger of God. The angel of the Lord came in the sixth chapter of Joshua, in the fifth chapter of Joshua, in, when Joshua was in battle, and Joshua fell down and kneeled, knelt down at his feet. Any angel would not have taken that kneeling or that adulation from Joshua. That was Christ, the angel of the Lord. Angels will not receive worship. We find that in the 22nd chapter when John, the beloved, bowed at the feet of an angel. He said, you stand upon your feet. I'm a man just like you. Don't you bow to me. Only the Messiah will be bowed to, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. That's Jesus. We know that's Him. And He has the little book in His hand. And that's His statutes and His laws. The little book, God's authority, right hand means authority. We are God's authority upon the earth. The little book is our hearts. The law is now written upon fleshy tables of our hearts, which it used to be written on tables of stone kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled. Now our hearts are sprinkled. Therefore, our hearts are the little book. And only God can dictate how that book will come out of our mouths. God has our hearts in His hand. And look what happens here. Go and take the little book in verse 8 of chapter 10. Which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went into the, I went into the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book, and he said to me, Take it and eat it. It shall make thy belly bitter. Mara means bitter. But it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Here's the bitter and the sweet. When we're looking at that 15th chapter, the last part of the 15th chapter, we're seeing the illustration of the Word of God being purified. How is it bitter in our... How is it uh, bitter? When we eat of the Word of God, first time you hear predestination is true, God doesn't love everybody, it kind of scares you, it makes you, gives you a funny feeling, it, man, that hurts so bad, and then the longer you live in the truth and God's statutes, it becomes sweet, doesn't it? It's hard when you first get into it. A lot of people will come here, leave here, and then come back here because it's too hard when they first hear it. I have learned to let people go, not let them go in resentment, just say, there they go, they're on a journey. And if God's working on them, they'll come back to Him. Not necessarily to us, they'll come back to Him somewhere along the way. But it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, it was, my belly was bitter and he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again. He's talking about to the church, you have to preach the little book that's written in your heart. And it's the same with the seven candlesticks or the seven spirits of the seven churches. Spirit is breath. The seven spirits is a picture of the oil that's inside the candlesticks. And before many people, nations and tongues and kings. Now let's go back over there to... to... Uh, Exodus, the 15th chapter. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. They were undeveloped. They were like babies trying to drink of the Word of God. It's too bitter. And God has to do something to make the water sweet. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. Do I believe that God just put these little stories in here and they don't connect with anything else? No, I don't ever believe that. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration from God and is profitable. That means every chronological list in the, book, in the Chronicles that so-and-so begets so-and-so begets so-and-so begets so-and-so. And we have studied a lot of those, haven't we? We can see David's chronology in First Chronicles and I don't even want to go into that right now. The people murmured against Moses. Oops, there they are again murmuring. This word of God is too bitter. You got us out here in the desert to die. These are the days of provocation according to Hebrews, the third chapter. They're provoking God, aren't they? And the people murmured against Moses saying, what are we going to drink now? Your word of God is too much. 
I've come to church. I've learned this predestination. I've learned that Christmas is pagan. I've learned daily cross death to self self now. I've learned that I have to, I have to uh, take my cross and die daily and be hated by the world. And I don't like it. It's too bitter. God says, I'm going to put you through fire and make it sweet. You know, fruit is only sweet when you have a real hot summer in California. Usually when it gets cold in Florida, don't buy Florida oranges. They're bitter. You got to have lots of fire, lots of heat to make the fruit of the Spirit Sweet. I won't buy California fruit. I mean, Florida fruit. Especially if they had a bad winter. That's the wrong thing to buy. You, you women know that, don't you? Do not buy Florida fruit. If they have a cold Florida, you pick those oranges up or those... Man, I picked up some some uh, clementines here first this season. And they were sour. They tasted like pickles. I took them. I don't ever take stuff back to the store. I told him a press. I said, don't. I said, y'all get these from Florida? He said, yeah. I said, you don't buy from Florida. I told the produce manager that. Not, not when they had a bad winter. A bad, not when they had a freezing uh, first of the year. And the people murmured again against Moses saying, what shall we go to drink now? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters... Tree of life, the tree, the tree which is Israel. Israel is called a fig tree. When God puts you in the church, puts you through the fire and the trials, God will make the bitter sweet. See, I don't, I wrestled with this for years. When I was a young kid, I'd read this and go, what is it talking about? Because I couldn't connect it with Revelation, with other places bitter and sweet. There he made for them a statute. But that's what the little book is. It's the Word of God. It's a statute, isn't it? Written upon our hearts. And an ordinance. And there he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken unto the voice, unto the little book that's written in your hearts, of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, keep his statutes and his commandments, when you read, and these are the same words, in Deuteronomy 28, the same words, in Leviticus the 26th chapter, which are sister chapters, and this would be a third sister with those chapters. Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, keep my statutes and my commandments. He said, I'll bless you. You're, he said, when you go out and when you come in, he said, I'll Fill up your storehouse, I'll fill up your field, I'll fill up. When you're obedient to me and trust me and quit trusting yourself and your lifestyle. You know why people don't want to follow God? They think, as believers, they make more sense than God makes with this book. That's what people, that's what young believers believe. I make more sense than you. I can go out here and have fun, God, and be a Christian too. He says, try it. I dare you to try it. After I get through with you, I'll beat you up and hurt you so bad you won't know. You'll think you got run over by a steamroller a thousand miles wide and a hundred miles long. It's going to have a wide, wide <laughs> flattening. <laughs> and give ear to the commandments and keep all these statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee. See, Benny Hinn quotes that. He yanks that one line out. One line says, none of these diseases. So therefore, God don't want anybody to have disease on him. He takes that one line out, says, I will put none of these diseases on thee. He says, that I put up on Egypt. And he's not talking about cancer. He's talking about flies and darkness and water to blood and, and the death of the firstborn. He said, I won't put these diseases on you that I did put up on Egypt. And the charismatic said, God didn't want to hurt anybody. Well, he's killing people over there in Egypt, isn't he? Which I brought up on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And then Benny Hinn will pull that verse out. I'm the Lord that healeth thee when you're obedient to me. 
And they came to Elam. Now here's the here's the second place mentioned here, but they had a whole lot of places in between, didn't they? We know that from the thirty third chapter of Numbers. They came to Edom, which means a place in the des desert, a stronghold. We don't know where it is. But you can look over there in Numbers, the 33rd chapter, and see what was between this Marah and Elam and what came after it. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, this is a month, now, this is a month after, a month after they leave. They left on the 15th day of the first month, didn't they? This is the 15th day of the second month. The 14th day of the first month is Passover. The next morning they left. So this is a month later. This is 30 days later. How long do they have to get to Sinai? Huh? They got, huh? They got 10 days, yeah, to get to Sinai. And after their departing out of the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron again, griping again. And unto the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when he killed all those firstborns. Wish you'd have left the blood off their doors. You brought us out here to die when we sat by the flesh pots, when we sat by cooking, cooking all these different foods in Egypt. And when we did eat bread to the full, for you have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. This is where they're provoking God. Remember there in Hebrews, the third chapter, the writer of Hebrews says, these are the days of provocation in the wilderness. They're provoking God because they're murmuring against God, not unlike the Christians in America, not unlike some people at Grace and Truth from time to time, every day, every week. And it's been me a lot in the past. I try not to complain anymore. I've trying to come to a place only because of age and experience God has brought me to a place where very seldom having any excitement in my liver anymore in my spleen splanknids am I remember that I don't have the excitement and the frustration I don't have the let me put it this way no not much more Mary I'm not oh, taking thought if you get old enough you'll never take thought then said the Lord unto Moses behold I will rain bread from heaven for you. Um, a thousand square miles of bread every morning. You, where did that bread come from? From heaven. You know what Jesus called himself? The bread from heaven in the sixth chapter of John. We'll look at that in a minute. I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no, or not. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day, on Friday, we're going to have a Sabbath on the seventh day, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gathered daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, at evening, then, you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. Because he's taking care of you through the day. It's going to be 120 degrees out there, 130, and your feet are not going to swell up, and your shoes are not going to wear out, and your clothes are not going to wear out for 40 years. So said, that's what I'm going to do for you. Those are signs that the Pharisees sought after. Give us a sign if you're the Messiah. And... In the morning, then, you shall see, oh, excuse me, six. Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, At evening, this is their word, you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt, because of what he supplies that day. In the morning, then, and this applies to us. Do you think God's any different today than he was then? You say, I want to be prosperous, and I want to be in the promised land tomorrow. I'm sorry you got 40 years to go. 
You know, God may have to work on you at least 40 years before he can get your attention. He may have to beat you up a long time. Do you think God did kill off all the rebellious people out there, but do you think the ones that weren't rebellious had an easy time in that desert? You're really committed, committed to God. You're not going to have an easy time, but you're going to get the promised land. Besides that, he's going to learn you to like sand and heat. He'll teach you that. He'll teach you to like the fire. You have to learn to embrace the fire. And when you do, it don't feel so bad. Now, what verse am I in? Eleven. Seven. In the morning, and in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord. What is the glory of the Lord? Or should I say who is the glory of the Lord? The glory of the Lord is is Jesus according to Hebrews, the first chapter. And the heavens declare the glory of God in the 19th chapter of Psalms. And Jesus is that glory. And who was it that set up on the Ark of the Covenant and came down in that fire? The I Am of the Old Testament. Jesus said, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And when he said, I am the door of the sheepfold, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am. And he said, I am the bread. Every time he was saying that, he was saying, I am the I am God. He had many I ams. In the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. The glory of the Lord is a he. Look over there in Hebrews, the first chapter. There's so much to this. I hope you're beginning to understand that. If we go, as we go through this, you're going to see all this is comparing us to what's going on over there. Hebrews, first chapter. Hebrews 1. God, who, hath, who at sundry times or various times, and in diverse, diverse, we get our word diverse from that, various kinds of places or manners, spake in time past unto the Father by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, speaking of Jesus, being the brightness of his glory. Jesus is the brightness of the glory of God, isn't he? And the express image of his hypostasis, of his understanding. He is the way we understand the Father. Hypostasis is the same word as substance in Hebrews 11.1. 1. The way we understand God is through Jesus coming upon the earth and preaching to us and being a man of like passions as we are, that's what he says. Uh, he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin in verse 15 of chapter 4. So he's the express image of his person, upholding all the things in the power of his power when he hath had himself purged our sins. So let's go back over there to Exodus. You can read the first part of the 19th chapter of Psalm. The heavens declare the glory of God. And that's in that series I did on the gospel and the stars. Now, let's go back over here to chapter 16 of Exodus, and I was in verse 8. What are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. When you murmur in this world, God says, I'm with you all the way even to the end of the world, and we must through much tribulation enter into Canaan or enter into the kingdom of God or enter into the church. We have to, our trying of your faith is more precious than gold that perisheth, when he says that, when Peter says that, or James says that, when Peter says, try your faith more precious than gold that perish it, though it be tried by fire, he's talking about the same thing that they were going through here. We're going through the trying of our faith. We're just like coming out of Egypt. We're in the we're out of the we're we're coming out of the world spiritually. We're living in this this wilderness, coming towards the promised land. 
And Moses spake unto Aaron, verse 9, Say unto the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel. Aaron is Moses' older brother. God's going to appoint him the high priest of Israel. Three years older than Moses. That they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. That's Jesus in the cloud, isn't it? That's the I am. Right? That's the glory in the cloud. When it says the glory of the Lord, look in Hebrews and he'll tell you what the glory of the Lord is. It's a who. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmuring of the children of Israel. You can look at that tabernacle over there. The glory of the Lord. The cl he came down and sat upon the Ark of the Covenant. That was his throne. Our heart's the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the glory of the Lord sits upon our hearts that the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, At evening you shall eat flesh. I'm going to give you doves in the evening. And in the morning you shall be filled with bread. 300,000 of you, and what did he say? Gosh, how many acres? How many thousands of square miles is it going to take and you shall know that I am the Lord your God and it came to pass that evening the quails came up and covered the camp in the morning the dew lay round about the host and when the dew that lay was gone up behold upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing as small as the hoar frost or the gray frost upon the ground. When the word hoar, H-O-A-R, is used, the, it's a white color, actually. The hoar-headed man, the gray-headed man, is a wise man. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, it is mon. Mon means what is it? What is it? God says, that's what we'll call it. What is it? For they knew not what it was. They did not discern the bread. They just didn't discern the bread. What is the bread in the New Testament? The body? The church, right? Remember the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians? Go over and look at it real quick. 11th chapter. Goodness, I've got so many places to go. I'm moving awful slow, but I don't know what else to do. I thought I was going to speed up tonight. Look here at the 11th chapter. Remember that, huh? They moved slow in the wilderness. Well, didn't they? Most people, when they teach Old Testament, don't teach all the shadows and the images. That's what we're going to be looking at. 1 Corinthians 11, chapter. Remember, take eat, this is my body, in verse 24, I'm running out of time. Uh, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, and the body is the bread. The bread is the body, and that's the church. Remember that? Drink of a cup, men to under a go of death. And those that drink unworthily, to drink unworthily, that was a Passover term. That was, uh, that was coming in contact with the dead body. Remember that? And then going and protecting the Passover. And then he says down here that it, whoever eats and drinks unworthy is guilty of the body and blood of Christ. And then he says in verse 28, Let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body, not discerning the bread. And Jesus said he was the bread come down from heaven in John 6, right? So this picture over here of the manna, the shadow is the manna. The very image is Christ, the bread come down from heaven. He said so. He said that in John the 6th chapter, I am the bread. Look at that real quick. Look at John 6. I don't have time to get into it. 
we'll go all the way through it, John 6. And he has references to this bread of the 16th chapter of Exodus. Look here in John 6. We're looking at shadows and images. He says here in John 6, uh, Verse 31, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is He which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And that's Jesus. And He's talking about Himself. He's the manna, isn't He? That's the shadow. And He goes all the way through this. He says, Verily, verse 47, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. I am is to say, Jehovah is the bread of life. I am the bread that came down from heaven. I wish I had time to read all that, but let's go back over here to the 16th chapter of Exodus. I'm just about out of time, right? Huh? Am I out? Well, let's read a little bit of this. This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Christ, the true bread. That's why he used the word true. I'm the true bread. And he compared himself in John 6 with this right here, didn't he? Huh? Somebody say yes or no. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is the thing which the Lord had commanded, gather of it every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man from them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. When they did meet it out with a homer, omer, which is a measure, he that gathered much had nothing over, he that gathered little had no lack. And that reminds me of the 8th chapter of 2nd, 2nd Corinthians. Look at it real quick, 2nd Corinthians 8th chapter. If you think this is all accidental, it's not. It's just a bunch of boring Old Testament verses. He says in the 8th chapter of 2nd Corinthians, these 8th and ninth chapter, the benevolent chapters, <laughs> you find it one place, you're going to find it another. He's talking about Macedonia sending money to Corinth because they were too lazy to support themselves. And he says in verse 11, Now therefore perform the doing of it as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance out of that which ye have. For if there be a first willing mind, it is accepted according to their man hath and not according to what he doesn't have. For I mean not that other men be eased and you burdened, and by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance may be a supply for your want, that there may be an equality as it is written. He that had gathered much had nothing over. He that had gathered little had no lack. So there would be an equality. That's what he's talking about over there in that 16th chapter of Exodus. You see that? And I'm out of time. We're going to look at the shadows because Jesus is the bread from heaven. I'm not moving very fast. I want to move faster, but y'all have to excuse me. I'm moving as fast as I can. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for word and for truth. God, help us to continue to learn this book. Help us to see the truth. God will praise you and glorify you for all things. Lord, help the flock to mature and grow up. And to cease from sin. Lord, we have to cease from sin if we're trusting and believing you. If we don't, we're trusting ourselves and we're continuing in our own works, which is sin. We cannot rest in your Sabbath, your spiritual Sabbath, which is daily, until we cease from sin. He that has ceased from sin, you said, that he's resting. Thank you for truth. Lead us to your elect. Open up many doors and we'll give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen.